we're going to start, Philippa, with The Sun. Um, this is a warning from the paper to uh, David Cameron. We're seeing red. Five months ago, we, the paper, told you, the Prime Minister, that EU immigration must be curbed after voters' devastating verdict. Now it's time to get your finger out. Yeah, I'm a, I hope that the uh, main parties don't capitulate to this sort of pressure, actually. Mm. Um, but it sounds like Cameron is capitulating with his too big, too bossy, too interfering, which does sound a little bit like a toddler, doesn't it? Mm. But I feel like it's like too much like UKIP re rhetoric to me mm. rather than to anything else. Um, you know, it, the, uh, it's so simplistic. We know mm. when we're in a, in, a, in a sticky situation financially and we, we're, we're suffering austerity to just sort of go, let's run away from Europe. Let's, let's blame the... the uh, blame the immigrants. Uh, blame the immigrants, blame mm. the EU, mm. uh, when actually, rather than finding uh, things to project our fear and blame onto, we should be thinking about how to... Um, make more jobs. Yeah, well, uh, growth is a big issue. But the fact is, Simon, uh, what can actually David Cameron do about immigration? About a lot of it is from the EU. From the EU, do anything about that. From the EU, very, very little indeed. It's, it's fundamental to the whole um, single European market. You have mm. free movement of capital and business, and with that comes free movement of people. Mm -hmm. And um, some of them have gone out of the country yep. and are still claiming we, their child. We, <laughs> <laughs> we're we're going to discuss that, I think, a little bit later on. We forget yeah. that, don't we? You know, just as immigrants can come here, yeah, there we are, can go over there. There and, are many I mean, thousands many, of Brits living on the coast of Spain. How many Brits are there in the for God's yeah. sake? Yeah, yeah. yeah all uh, over the place. There's, so there's, there's very little actually he can do about this. Now, yeah. This has been the problem, the bind he's put himself in, in a way. He's, yeah. he's making pledges on what he was going to do about immigration, mm. when quite a fundamental part of it was something that was simply out of his control from the EU. Um, and, and just as, an, as a, another point from the, the, the business community's point of view, large swathes of the business community uh, regard immigration as economically extremely beneficial. Mm. Um, they regard it as, 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 as bringing skills in that we may well lack and may have a shortage of. Um, and the idea that it's, it's automatically a negative for the economy is... is is, to say the least, right. arguable. But, but Philippa, uh, uh, UKIP have moved tack now on this because they're, they're basically ignoring the econo economic argument because all the data does seem to suggest that migrants actually help the economy. Yeah. What UKIP's argument seems to be now is what it does on a, another level, and that is social cohesion. It is, you know, um, uh, causing problems for local councils having to deal with 150 languages in a school, for instance. That's what you, that's UKIP's argument. Does that have any resonance for, 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 for the majority of people, do you think? Well, I think what UKIP is doing is stirring up fear. And uh, fear is, a, you know, an emotion that grabs you. And they're, they're, mm. they're sort of stirring it up and... Uh, and then using it to say, well, I'm making you very fri frightened, but then vote for us and then you won't have to be frightened any longer. Mm. So it's just fear mongering. And I think the way we're giving so much attention to UKIP is actually our addiction to fear as well. You know, we, we like the, the drama of it, but actually there's not that much to, to, uh, that, that, that's happening compared to the fuss we're making about it. I mean, the Greens right. increased their seats by 50% in mm. the EU, and I don't see all the headlines being about that. Mm. UKIP is just sort of story-worthy because, um, well, they do seem like um, not a very is serious it, party. Well, it's a good talker, Mr Farage, isn't it? But that's a, that's a, that's a very yeah. important point that Philip has made, isn't it? You know... It, the leaders in Brussels are meeting tonight. They're, you know, running around, headless chickens, it would seem on the outside. But the fact is, yes, some of these parties, Syriza in Greece and the Front National, they've made inroads, mm. but they're not wiping the floor with the rest of, 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 of the European parties. And the pro-European parties are still very much in the ascendant. Yeah, I, well, I think one of the interesting things, um, the very back of the envelope statistics about the European elections in mm. the UK um, a couple of days ago now, um, is that... Turnout was about 36%. Uh, I think very roughly the UKIP vote, which one would have thought, if you are a UKIP supporter, this is the one election you, you turn you out, out for. There. Exactly. So they will have had a better turnout than other parties, one would have thought. Yeah. And they got about somewhere between 25 and 30% mm. of the vote. So that represents something like 10% of the British population voted UKIP. 
Um, so I think there is a risk that we, we, we're we, get, we get a this. bit out of proportion yeah. Yeah. the idea that there's been Absolutely. a sweeping UKIP vote across the UK. Uh, it, it's been dramatic in lots of ways, but I, 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 I think, think we need to be careful. I think we're more addicted to the drama of it than it actually being yeah. that significant. Hmm. Interesting, very interesting. And of course, UKIP didn't do very well in London. No, indeed. Yeah. Uh, and it's interesting, uh, Philippa's point about uh, the fear of something other yeah. and something that... And actually, oddly, London is where one can see the melting pot that is modern Britain more than anywhere else. Mm. UKIP's strongest performances have been in places in the country where actually... And I, I, I live in one of the home counties outside London, and you don't, you don't see uh, immigration, you don't see that melting pot, mm. but those are the parts of the country that oddly have done very well for UKIP. Yeah, uh, it's an intriguing paradox. Very, very interesting. Okay, um, the front of the Times, Lib Dems consumed by infighting, Simon. Um, Nick Clegg, um, the party tonight, put out um, very swiftly um, a refutation of the suggestion that he was willing to stand down. Yes, I, 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 this is going to sound like I'm having a cheap shot at, at Nick Clegg, but I genuinely am not, because I, I kind of think surely, surely he considered standing down. It would be inconceivable if he didn't, even if, if, he, didn't, he, yeah. even if he very rapidly went, no, 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 yeah. it's not the right thing to do. The idea that yeah. it never crossed his mind, I, I find incredible. Yeah. Um, but what I think is intriguing about this, and we talked earlier about the poll that was done by Lord Oakshot, which mm -hmm. has caused some, some rows and ructions inside the Liberal Democrats, because it's seen as destabilising Nick Clegg. And here we have... Uh, Lady Williams saying that that she felt that she believed he had considered resigning. This feels like the beginning of a, of a kind of rot. Mm. Um, once this kind of thing begins, I feel, in a political party, it's very hard to stop it. Uh, and there's, there's, there's a danger for the Lib Dems and, and that it becomes self-fulfilling, that the row just builds, mm. because how you calm something like this down... And it seems irrelevant, be... doesn't it, that uh, Lady Williams had actually misinterpreted the remarks that Clegg made, which was that he would stand down if he felt he was hurting the party. Yeah. And he says he doesn't think he is. So yeah. um, he didn't say he would stand down. She uh, misinterpreted what he said. But that doesn't matter. No, it doesn't matter Simon because the furor is happening. It was such a debacle for the, for the Liberal Democrats that if it didn't cross his mind... It would be extraordinary. I mean, it, it would one be... Might, yeah. One would be rather shocked for a politician who suffered a, a trouncing like that who didn't go, hmm, hmm. even if for a second. <laughs> <laughs> but is it is it really, Philippa, do you think, all about the leader? Isn't it about possibly changing your mind on tuition fees? Isn't it about perhaps being a centre-left party before mistake. the election and moving the other way after the election? That was his big mistake. And he has, um, in the cartoons, and uh, been shown up a lot as being under... Um, Cameron's thumb, mm. uh, rather a lot. That, that has made him a bit of a, yeah. a laughing stock. Whether he is or not, I don't know. But that's how he's portrayed yeah. um, so often in the media and uh, you know the through satirical, the master, yeah. satirical magazines and, and what have you. Mm. Um, whereas Vince Cable is shown more as standing up to Cameron more. Mm. Mm. Um, but yeah. he's the underdog at the moment, for, even though he is the leader. So that will make him popular again with the yeah. British public. All right. Capitalism is doomed if ethics vanish, says Carney. Uh, Simon? Uh, yes, well, this is part of this conference that's been taking place uh, in London with, with many of the great and the good, including Mark Carney uh, and Christine Lagarde of the IMF, uh, uh, bewailing the, the woes of particularly the banking system and how it has inadequately reformed itself. Mm. But I think, I think the thrust of that headline actually is quite pertinent um, because I think a lot of the pushback, which was one of the things Christine Lagarde said was coming from the financial services industry and the, uh, the financial markets against regulatory change, I think a lot of people in that world regard regulatory pressure as something that is anti-capitalist, when in actual fact, mm. um, uh, capitalism in some ways it needs to be saved from itself in some circumstances by having some regulatory pressures put upon it, having some ethics injected into it, um, if, it is, if it is to survive. Mm. Um, it's not a question of being anti-capitalist, to require that capitalism has ethics and has regulation and has control over it. Right. I mean, does that make sense to you? It makes a lot of sense to me. I mean... I think we all need regulating, actually. I mean, if I can get away with parking on a double yellow line because the wardens never go on that bit, mm. I will do it uh, because I am corruptible. Mm. And um, I'm not going to see the double yellow lines and think, oh, I mustn't park there even though the wardens never come to this bit. I'm going to park there. But, but, but and it, I don't think it's any different right. 
If you're a banker and you can get away with stuff that benefits you, you will do it if no one taps you on the shoulder. If someone taps you on the shoulder, if the equivalent of the warden is there, then we will have proper regulation. Because I think that basically we are all susceptible to being corrupted. And I don't think bankers or capitalists are any different. And we need this regulation and we need it five years ago. And we certainly need it now. Well, as I say, I mean, I think a lot of people will be surprised that, you know, five years on after the crash, you know, the kind of regulation or the kind of smart regulation that some people have been calling for doesn't seem to have, uh, have been implemented. Um, we're going to go to The Guardian, actually, um, front page again. Google is launching smart watches. Simon? Yes, I, I, I'm. I, we are still in the middle of this technological revolution. I know. Um, we've, only just, we've only just technology started. Technology can wear it, it, is indeed, very yes. odd, isn't it? Mm. Uh, clearly, that that that's where a lot of these technology companies are going. It's, it's trying to bring technology even more mm. integrated into your life in some way. I mean, I, I'm still kind of amazed by the revolution we've had. Um, with with, with oh, touch screen up touch screen um, tablets and, and, I, and, I, and I love them and I think they've been quite a substantial shift yeah. bringing them into glasses and watches it's clearly the next step I mean mm. I, I don't I've not tried the glasses I believe you have I tried have Google tried glasses, the glasses and, and, uh, did they make sense briefly they made a lot of sense and the uh, the guy that lent them to me had to wrestle with me to get them <laughs> to back off because I thoroughly enjoyed them <laughs> All right, I, I think okay. the trouble is with this watch yeah. is that as the guy from Jawbone told me the other day people don't like wearing stuff that's right. That's so right. They're, I don't they're know. Time on their, um, oh, um, since we've got the phones, we've ditched right. the watch. So. I've been told I've got to wrap up. Okay. So, Philippa. Hello. Up. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Simon Philippa, it's been great having you in. Thanks for the stories behind the headlines. Many, many thanks for that.